And in 1785, he would write to John Newton, I had a dream 12 years ago before the recollection of which all consolation vanishes. And it seems to me must always vanish. So we have words there of a man who, um, you know, for the, the last 20 plus years of his life was living in constant distress and depression. Welcome back to another episode of Him Partial, the podcast where we talk all things church music. I'm Monet Funga. And I'm Cara Devro. And in this episode, we are delighted to welcome Reagan King, our special guest. We'll be talking about the Bible's view on depression, the life of the hymn writer William Cooper, and songs that struggling Christians can sing to remind themselves of the great hope we have. But before we start, we do think it's probably important to say that we know some of our listeners either have struggled with or are struggling with some of these issues so we just want to let you know that we will be talking about depression and as we do we will be mentioning a couple of times when Cooper himself tried to take his own life so there will be heavy subjects ahead. Yes indeed it will be a heavy discussion but a fruitful one Um, but before we jump in we just want to make sure you don't miss out on our weekly newsletters. We promote this every week and yet some of you still have not signed up. This week's newsletter features some really cool bonus content that we were discussing with our guest Reagan. However if you're listening to this episode and you have yet to sign up you've already missed out so head on over to himpartial.com sign up for our newsletter today. Subscribers to our newsletter are also the first to hear of our new episodes and can submit mailback questions. That's right. Like this week's mailback question from a listener, they ask, I don't really like the hymns slash songs that my church plays on a Sunday. What should I do? So this is a difficult question because there are any number of reasons that you might not like the hymns or songs that your church plays. One of the first things that you have to remember is that worship is about God and not about you and your taste. So worship, um, my pastor was preaching actually on this really recently, and he was saying about how worship is service to God. Um, So it's you that is doing the serving. You're not there to be served. Mm -hmm. So if it's just a matter of, I don't like that they use a guitar or I'm not keen on choruses or I Mm. hate the organ then to be honest you kind of need to think about whether it's a taste thing rather than than um, a theological issue Mm -hmm. the other thing is that you if you're a member of a local church you need to both trust and submit to your eldership And if they are um, choosing the music, then you need to trust them. You know, Mm -hmm. your pastor knows you. He knows it's good for you. Uh, You would hope that they're choosing songs that they want to edify you and to build you up. And if they're not, then (laughs) that's a whole other issue. (laughs) Um, But yeah, caring about what, what you sing on Sunday is a part of why we do this show. So I know that in the past, I've thought that I didn't like... The music in church. So the first Reformed church that we went to, I hated the organ. I didn't really understand the hymns and I didn't like them. Um, But I started to pay attention to the lyrics. And that's something that I recommend because pay attention to the lyrics. If you can't sing them in good conscience, then by all means, talk to your elder about it don't be rude don't come in like this is heresy we can't sing this just say Mm -hmm. you know I've been thinking about this and could you explain it to me or Mm -hmm. have you thought about this sort of thing and then lastly um you may not have control over what is sung in church but you can choose what you want to sing in your own personal daily devotions Mm -hmm. and if you're concerned that what you're singing in church on Sunday is too fluffy then get yourself a hymn book you can pick Mm -hmm. them up for a couple quid online um and in your daily devotions just read or sing the hymns and think about the lyrics and you might surprise yourself yeah 
Yeah, thanks, Car. That's a really insightful answer. I'll add to um, to your last point. There's also lots of great um, apps out for free or very cheap. And I know we plug this hymnal all the time, but the Christian Hymns app is very good. And you could download it for free. Loads of their songs are also for free, or you could pay like two pounds for the like full version. And it plays the piano like like MIDI files or whatever for each song. It has um, various like um, tunes for the songs, like all the related tunes for each of the songs and the lyrics right in front of you. And it's a really good app for personal and even family devotion. Um, my husband uses it all the time at home. Um, and it's a great way to kind of explore um, the hymns that we know to be, you know, sound and trusted in your personal life so agree it's that app is also good because if you hate the tune to a hymn and you think it's terrible it will recommend other tunes Mm -hmm. as well so if you're struggling with you don't like the tunes then pick a different tune (laughs) yeah so our guest today is a busy busy man pastor Regan king is joining us from london town he's the pastor of the angel church islington and a Wycliffe preacher for the Protestant Truth Society. He authored the book, TBH, Basic Challenges to Millennials Who Can't Even. And he's also the co-founder of the Pregnancy Crisis Helpline. He, co- he co-hosts Behind the Headlines on Revelation TV. And Reagan is married to Rachel, who I have to say is very lovely. And Reagan has recently been promoted to proud dad to his son, Randall. Reagan, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, that latter bit is probably the most important thing at the moment. Um, <laughs> every time I, I look at Randall, um, that's the baby's name, um, yeah, he just gives such joy. R- really happy days. Aww. Well, he's beautiful, and we can't wait to get down there, have you guys up here to finally meet him. Absolutely. He's uh, he's chuckling away. He laughs inexplicably at different things. <laughs> I wish I could know what he's laughing at, um, but it's good fun. How how many, how old is he? He's five months and wow. two weeks time. Wow, that went fast. I know, really did. I know. And he's already in like a, I think he's already starting to wear some stuff that's about nine months <laughs> and it's not all that big. So I'm fully anticipating that he'll be taller than me. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on our show, Regan. It's good to see you. We wanted to have you on because in recent years, you've written and spoke publicly about hymns and depression. And we think this is a vitally important topic, given our current global climate, especially at the moment. Um, And maybe even just in general, um, as mental health is more of an issue these days, it's a lot more public. And um, in general, depression is not terribly well understood and often stigmatized. But before we dig in, how does the Bible deal with depression and how would scripture define it? Well, it's such an important question to ask and would say that so often I've come across unhelpful ideas and uh, manner of speaking in Christian circles when it comes to depression. I've heard some people almost deny that the Bible has anything to say about it. Wow. Uh, Proverbs fifteen thirteen says, A joyful heart makes a cheerful face, but when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. And it's that breaking of the spirit. It's that lowliness of, of mind and heart. It's um, a, a sense of, immense burden. Sometimes it's unexplainable and inexplicable that um, can really um, point to depression in the scriptures. We, we see Job. Um, he himself was in immense anguish to the point that he said, my soul is pulled out within me. Days of affliction have seized me at night. It pierces my bones within me and my gnawing pains take no rest. Just constant restlessness. Elijah, um, he had at one point, after a very real spiritual high, when you would think he would be like on cloud nine or something, he, he actually asked that his life would be taken away from him. Mm. Um, Jonah, again, you know, seen what many people would long for um, in their uh, their life and their service ministry. Uh, he's seen a, a whole city 
come to um, a place of repentance and transformation and change. And he asks that God would take his life from him because he can't bear the idea of these despicable people um, being saved. David um, speaks and in one place, my uh, tears have been my food day and night. Mm. Why are you in despair, oh my soul? And there are at least 45 Psalms that show David specifically as one who, um, just reading the Psalms, you have to diagnose him with depression, yeah. uh, um, both spiritual and mental varieties. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think when I think of depression in scripture, I, I immediately think of the Psalms and Job as well. But it's good to to hear of those other bits as well, where it's very clearly um, something that spiritual men and women struggle with. And it, it's not a disqualifier, though. I know that's not necessarily the topic of this conversation. <laughs> um, when even even if you consider you know, we're recording this in uh, the week leading up to um, Easter Sunday, mm -hmm. right before his betrayal and crucifixion, Jesus said, my soul is deeply grieved mm -hmm. at the point of death. So even Jesus can step in and relate to your depression. I mean, yeah. you know, this idea that it's unspiritual is just, yeah, it's, it's nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, since this particular show is obviously about hymns, mm. um, you know, where do we see examples? I kind of mentioned one just there, but where do we see examples of singing in the midst of depression or being downcast in scripture? Oh, well, throughout the Psalms, this, you have to go to the Psalms. Um, there have been some points where I've um, felt particularly low and beaten up, and I've, um, I, I've encouraged others and ministry and said, like, if you feel those moments where you think you're prayed out or you're, you're mm -hmm. just read through the Psalms, read them aloud, sing them aloud if you know the tunes. But if you don't know any of the tunes, make, make up the tunes. Just, yeah. just be in the Psalms because there are you. You see time and time again um, this very real uh, element of highs and lows, victories and defeats, uh, joy and sadness, um, just the cycle of life that, if we're honest, most of us go through. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, definitely look at Psalm 6, Psalm 13, um, 18, 23, 25, 27. Um, look at the Psalms of Ascent, Psalm um, 121, uh, 123, 124. Those are um, in the Psalms of Ascent, very, very obviously pointing um, to this sort of depression, this distress, this despair um, that um, we see the, the psalmist processing in prayer and mm -hmm. praise. And the, the beauty of it is that so often in that process, um, after working through the sadness, after working through the tears, there's always a but. There's always a like, this is what I what I need. This is in you. I have hope. So mm -hmm. uh, consider lamentations. It's you know <laughs> the name gives it away a bit. Yeah. It's a whole book, Bible book out of depression. <laughs> And um, Jeremiah, believed to be the uh, writer, um, known as the weeping prophet. And if you read the prophecy of Jeremiah, you'll understand, um, listeners to this will understand why. Uh, he said, um, my soul has been rejected from peace. I have forgotten happiness. So I say my strength has perished and so is my hope from the Lord. Mm. So, yeah, place after place, but particularly the Psalms and Lamentations. That's good, too, because I know we, we've talked about on the show before, but in this country particularly, there's such a strong psalm-only, um, exclusive psalmody kind of tradition in terms of uh, what people will sing during a worship oh. service. So there's obviously um, a kind of long history of, of God's people singing these psalms that have this kind of full scope of emotions and joy and, and laughter and despair and, 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 and turmoil. And I think that that's, that's kind of, we think about the full counsel of God, like, you know, mm. being able to sing those Psalms is really important, I think, for the Christian. 
Absolutely. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, said, wherever the Psalter is abandoned, an uh, incomparable treasure vanishes from the Christian church. Mm. With recovery will come unexpected power. Um, I'm not an exclusive somnodist, um, but I, I do believe that uh, we're missing something if we replace, um, if we just chuck out all psalms. And that's very often what we have in evangelical um, Protestant churches. We um, we, we've chucked out all of the psalms in many cases. Um, so, you know, one of the things in um, pastoring the, the angel church um, that sought to instill in people is a, a desire to go through the psalms. So as a congregation, we read a psalm, full psalm, every Sunday aloud together. Mm-hmm. Um, we try to incorporate singing the psalms um, into service as well. Um, and it, it just instills deep rich spiritual truths um, that really relate even to this issue we're talking about um, in relation to depression. Yeah. yeah. I really love the honesty of the Psalms. Um, I was thinking about Psalm 42 in particular, where he says, hope in God, O my soul, for you will yet praise him. And it's kind of like sometimes you don't feel like you're ever going to be able to praise him again, mm. um, but you just got to hope in him and it, it'll come. So, we saw in one of your talks, you spoke about the hymn writer, William Cooper. Um, can you tell us a little bit about him and what he specifically brings to this discussion on depression and hymn singing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, William Cooper is a, a very interesting character to study. He was born um, on the 26th of November, 1731. And uh, his mother died while he was quite, quite young. Mm. Growing up, he had a love of reading. He enjoyed um, particularly John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, He was a very intelligent, academic uh, man. He began training in law. Um, Unfortunately, his personal life presented some very real challenges, and this is uh, very often uh, where depression can set in for for people, Um, Mm -hmm. personal issues, particularly relationships. Uh, where there's um, a relationship breakdown, the, um, the consequences in some cases can be very catastrophic. Mm. And that's certainly the case with William Cooper. He, um, he fell in love with his cousin. Okay? Uh, that's kind of something that happened a good, a good bit in those days. Mm. Um, and some places it'd be, you know, t- today. But um, the, the marriage was um, refused repeatedly. Um, I mean, his cousin did apparently reciprocate, but, you know, the family were not keen at all. And um, in no uncertain terms was um, this put off by the cousin's father. Um, So he kind of has to try and move on from that. He throws himself into his uh, legal studies. He um, is offered a role in regard to administration within the House of Lords. But in 1763, he breaks under the strain of all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, The day before a parliamentary examination, he actually set out to drown himself, uh, took a cab to Tower Wharf. Um, But here's the thing. He he became increasingly frustrated over the course of that night because he tried drowning himself. He tried, um, uh, and the water was too low. He goes home and he tries to take um, laudanum, which is um, a, a, an opiate. He tried to OD on that. Uh, and his uh, fingers closely contracted and couldn't open um, the bottle, so he couldn't do that. He, um, he, he tried um, to hang himself three times with the garter. Um, and he tried to stab himself. Uh, the, the knife broke. The, uh, the, the garter he was trying to hang himself with broke. He did become unconscious, but when he awoke um, from that state of unconsciousness, he just had a sense of deep shame, self-doubt. Mm-hmm. He, um, yeah, he just had self-loathing. He mm-hmm. um, was found um, eventually after trying to hang himself again. Um, the bed frame breaks. He's not even able to to kill himself. Um, is what he's thinking. Um, so. Um, the lady who was doing the laundry um, found him. Mm. Narrator describing his experience as that he felt for himself a contempt not to be expressed or imagined. 
wherever he went into the street, it seemed as if every eye flashed upon him with indignation and scorn. Mm. It felt as if he had offended God so deeply that his guilt could never be forgiven, and his whole heart was filled with tumultuous pangs of despair. Madness was not far off, or rather madness was already come. Needless to say, that canceled his career. Uh, and, and that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning of his story. Wow. Wow. And it's, it's I, I, I know little bits about Cooper. Um, my husband's a huge Cooper fan, and obviously he's written so many hymns. Um, so it is interesting just to, to like get these real raw stories. I think sometimes we kind of uh, whitewash like, you know, his historical figures in the church. We go, Oh, they're so wonderful. Look at, look at his hymns. They're so lovely. And then we just, Oh, don't talk about the real pain that this man was going through. Um, And I would believe and you could tell me if I'm wrong, would produce such, such rich hymns, the hymns that he came, uh, that he came up with came from this kind of, real experience and fight with within himself um and with god absolutely um prior to that um uh, those suicide attempts cooper was not a christian he was um someone who wrote a lot he did a lot of poetry he was um a, a celebrated poet um in his own right in a secular capacity but mm-hmm. um Cooper wasn't a Christian, and so he, while he had this belief in God, he um, did not sense any right relationship with him at that stage. So, um, you know, he felt himself to be nothing more than a dirty little thing he would write uh, in the eye of God. And um, after his marathon of failed suicide attempts, was admitted to a mental asylum by his father. It was there that the presiding doctor was Christian, presented the gospel to Cooper and prayed with him. Um, and one day he was reading the story of uh, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, in John chapter 11. Mm. And he read Romans 3.25. And it was there that uh, William Cooper um, w- would speak of how it was as though his, his eyes were opened by God to the beauty of grace offered in the gospel, he he would write in his journal, immediately I received the strength to believe it and the full beams of the son of righteousness shone upon me. I saw the sufficiency of the full atonement he had made, my pardon sealed in his blood, all the fullness and completeness of his justification. In a moment I believed and received the gospel. My eyes filled with tears and my voice choked with transport. I could only look up to heaven in silent fear, overwhelmed with love and wonder. So that, that's how he came to faith. What actually got him um, really where he was um, writing hymns was encountering John Newton. I know John Newton is known for um, writing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me, and mm-hmm. so many other hymns. And um, it was um, Newton who became a leader in a church there um, where, where Cooper was. Um, it was through Newton's friendship with Cooper that they began to write hymns together, mm. compiling them. They called them the only hymns. And um, we, we see that that was of immense help and benefit to Cooper in dealing even with his ongoing issues of depression mm. because some people might say, oh, well, it ended, it would have ended after he became a Christian. No, mm. he had struggles. And they, at times, very, very bad, even worse than they had been. Mm. Um, but it was through the writing of these hymns and singing of them um, and through his friendship with Newton that he was able to uh, view his depression with perspective. Wow. Wow, well, that... Sorry, Cara, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, I remember when I was reading about Newton that I think Newton records in his diary at one point that he did manage to interrupt another suicide attempt by Cooper um, after he became a Christian and they were living in Olney. Mm. Um, so, yes, the issues didn't just kind of disappear. Definitely not. Definitely not. Um, it, it's kind of odd, you know, uh, Cooper had one of uh, slightly 
weird relationship with um, this this family, uh, the Unwins, uh, uh, a, a kind of a, a weird relationship, particularly with uh, Mary Unwin. Some would say uh, it was it was probably too close. Um, you can you can look at it, no one really knows the the fullness of what um, their relationship was, but. There's a lot in it that kind of looks a bit codependent mm. and um, very unhealthy, yeah. uh, certainly for someone who struggles already um, with um, a, a mental health condition, which Cooper clearly had. Um, he struggled with dreams as well. Uh, there was one dream that completely uh, wasted him. Um, it, it, it really took him back to uh, a very, very dark um, period of his time. He would um, uh, be plunged into um, great despair when his friend Mary Unwin died in 1796. Mm. He would go on to die four years later. Uh, you know, for, for many years, many of the last years of his life, Cooper um, could not bring himself to um, darken the door of a church because he, he just he lacked assurance he, he lacked um, a sense of hope he was mm-hmm. in absolute abject despair mm-hmm. um, his breakdowns you can look at them and say well there, there was some element potentially of seasonal affective disorder in some cases okay. they often came um, at their worst in january anyone you know you guys are up in, in scotland and scotland has a very high rate of depression um yeah. Also, a very high rate of substance abuse, and mm. were often linked to mm. a vicious cycle. Um, you know, across the UK, that can be a big problem. The days get very, very dark. It can be very cold. It can be very dreary. Mm. So, that may have impacted him in some way, along with all that was already present. Um, but uh, particularly in um, and in 1785, he would write to John Newton, I had a dream 12 years ago before the recollection of which all consolation vanishes. And it seems to me must always vanish. So we have words there of a man who, um, you know, for the, the last 20 plus years of his life was living in constant distress and depression. Mm. It's really tough. And, and I think you know, some of our listeners might be in this stage, you know, we, we always say, oh, it's been a tough year. It's been a tough year. Yes, it has been for a lot of people, but there are Christians listening who have had this struggle for much longer than the last year. Um, so I think it's possibly encouraging, but definitely maybe a little comforting just to know that, you know, this is a real thing that Christians go through. And, um, you know, the local church is there and should be there for their members to support them through these times of depression and and just kind of turmoil and loneliness. But I guess for our purposes, we would ask, what are some hymns you would kind of recommend to Christians who are struggling with this? Um, You know, being able to sing to God about their their problems and their pain, I think we kind of established already is really key. Um, and I was wondering if you had any that you knew of offhand to share. Well, uh, absolutely. Um, particularly, you can uh, look at William Cooper's hymns. Uh, they often touch very much on the subject. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Mm. Without that really shows the hope um, mm. of the gospel that's there. Um, John Newton himself, um, I, I think he is potentially uh, um, a better a- example in some ways of having found much peace despite having himself been. Um, he was a slave trader. He um, would said he, he would speak of. Um, the the haunting nature of the sins of, of the past and how they would regularly come to him. But um, New- Newton did not live in the same sense of helplessness as Cooper. Um, and, and that points, I think, in some way to the potential 
likelihood of um, clinical depression that Cooper was struggling with. Um, it wasn't only spiritual. Um, with Newton, you know, um, he he would sing uh, where real joy is found. Um, joy is a fruit that will not grow in nature's barren soil. All we can boast till Christ we know is vanity and toil. But where the Lord has planted grace and made his glories known, their fruits of heavenly joy and peace are found and there alone. A bleeding Savior is seen by faith, a sense of pardoning love, a hope that triumphs over death, gives joys to those above. To make a glimpse within the veil, to know that God is mine, are springs of joy that never fail, unspeakably divine. These are the joys that never fail. These are the joys that satisfy and sanctify the mind, which make the spirit mountain high and leave the world behind. So no more believers mourn your lot, but if you are the Lord's, resign to them that know him not such joys as earth affords. I think that that's a, a beautiful summary of how we may not, we may not have joy in some ways as the world has it. Um, we may struggle with depression, but we can have um, this ultimate hope of um, being released from it and, and delivered from it. Um, another one, go back to the scriptures, Lamentations I mentioned earlier. Um, Great is thy faithfulness, beautiful. Um, that is um, calming and that it sets our, our focus on the steadfast love of the Lord. Amen. I love those songs. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking of Be Still My Soul as well. That's quite a good one. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is a really horrible, mean question to ask you. Go on. Um, but what is your personal all-time favorite hymn or two or ten? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a really difficult one. That, um, and I'm, I'm going to know the definition because I, I have, I'm going to keep it to hymns, right? I'm going to keep it to hymns. So All right. um, uh, I like how great thou art. I really like how great thou art. Great by faithfulness. Um, yeah, th those would be two favorites. Honestly, the one that I go to again and again, Be Thou My Vision. Nice. Be Thou My Vision is probably my favorite because it, it, it really just sums up where I believe that the Christian's heart cry should be. Um, mm. Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Um, it, it looks at... at at what we desire and what we want in life, and then aligns our focus. It's a prayer, really. Mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll go with me on my vision. Great, great choices, and just random shameless plug. We do have episodes on all of those songs. Right. So if you're listening and you want to know more about the background of those songs, we will totally link it in the description so you can check them out there. Come thou fount of every blessing. That's another one. Sorry, that just came to mind. I had to <laughs> one there. I, I felt like I was betraying that one. That, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, these are all great hymns. And it's been great talking to you about this subject. Um, hopefully our listeners will find it very helpful and very edifying. Oh, I pray so for you can find Reagan at Reagan Blanton King. That's Reagan Blanton King, but without an A in Blanton <laughs> on Twitter. Or you can follow his pastoral work at The Angel Church. Much easier to spell. Reagan, it's been such a pleasure. We love having you. And thank you so much for making time to come and talk to us today. Oh, thank you, guys. It's really been, really been a joy. <laughs>